2018. So you, thank you. You know, Jeff, you, you thought I came all the way up here for only one announcement? Uh, I, I don't know. Is, is there more, Reggie? You know, of, of course there's more. <laughs> you know, for all of the fans out there, all of the fans who love what Platinum Games does, and we're thrilled to have Platinum Games back on a Nintendo platform, we've got, uh, we've got one more thing. Hello, my name's Helena Taylor, and I am the voice of Bayonetta, and I would like to explain to you why I didn't voice Bayonetta 3. Helena Taylor, who originally played Bayonetta before she dropped out for Bayonetta 3, posted a video in which she implored fans to boycott Bayonetta 3. I am asking the fans to boycott this game, and instead spend the money that you would have spent on this game donating it to charity. She refused to play the role of Benetta as a result of being offered a low pay of $4,000 flat to play the character for the entire game. The final offer to do the whole game as a buyout, a flat rate, was $4,000 US dollars. On part three of my video thread, I explained that their first offer was too low. The offer was $10,000 total. Wait a minute, wait just a damn minute. You, you said it was $4,000. So I'm just... The Bayonetta, Bayonetta voice actress said that she got only offered $4,000 to voice Bayonetta 3, and then apparently later on she ch she changed the tune and it was something like $15,000. Uh, but the voice actor like, yeah, she did. And also she was apparently into some weird fucking Twitter accounts, which is also not good. Everything I've done, my whole career, my whole life, was like it never happened. Your image, your likeness, your name erased. Oh my gosh, it was devastating. Come on, I've, I've eaten a crap sandwich out here. She also, like, insults Jennifer Hale, the voice actress who came in to voice Bayonetta 3 in the upcoming game after Helena Taylor declined the role. They now have a new girl voicing her own thing. And I love actors, I wish her all the joy in the world. I wish her all the jobs, but she has no right to say she is the voice of Bayonetta. I created that voice. She has no right to sign merchandise as Bayonetta. For some reason, she was super rude to her, saying she has no right to call herself Bayonetta and all this shit. We just came across as like very salty, moldy, and misplaced aggression. If I chop you up in a meat grinder, and the only thing that comes out that's left of you is your eyeball, <laughs> You're probably dead! Enough is enough! Wait, what? Wait. Oh my god! Hello, I'm Happy Gorius. Despite the devil's best efforts to drown my ass, I have returned to Earth once again to entertain the human masses. And much like last year, oh, it seems to be another hedonistic adventure with my old climax partner, Bayonetta. <laughs> and what an adventure we have today, as I have to delve into Bayonetta 3. A game that, after its release back in the fall, has garnered much praise and, well, also a lot of controversy, with several people either straight up loving the game or hating it so much that they end up refunding it. So now that the dust is settled and the recency bias has cleared, I can finally rear my colorful head in and truly deliver a climax worthy to all. Because after all, as long as I have my climax partner, nothing can stop us. Much like Alex Terrible and his porn addiction. It's real! And while I know it's taken me a bit of time, I am a bit, uh, I am a bitch, I am an old man after all. I still find it glorious to my glog nuts that I can even give you this climax with my ever so loving climax partner, 
Bayonetta. <gasps> Alright, anyway. There are three orcs, though, in my basement that I need to cook now and eat fast. So, let's get to this damn review. I'm tired of it. Without further ado, I introduce you to Bayonetta 3. A clown's third climax. Oh yeah, by the way, that motherfucker that invaded my first climax last time, he's been dealt with, don't worry. Trust me when I tell you, he will not be invading this fucking video, you piece of dog shit. Well, right off the bat, let's get probably the most controversial part of Bayonetta 3 out of the way, and that's the story. Because holy shit, Bayonetta 3's storyline is a clusterfuck of rabid scrounging events. I don't even know what scrounging means. If I were to pretty much sum up Bayonetta 3's storyline without going into insane autistic detail, it's basically some multiversal schlock that you'd see in a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie like Spider-Man or Doctor Strange Multiverse of Midness. Like, if I were to perfectly encapsulate my experience with this game, I'd say it feels like a straight-to-DVD sequel to Bayonetta 2 after it failed to break even at the box office. It just feels like an AI-generated multiversal plot with what just so happens to have Bayonetta, Jean, and all the other characters with some new ones as well. And I think that mostly just comes down to the fact that the writing in this game feels so damn shallow. A ton of returning characters like Luca, Jean, and even Bayonetta in certain parts just feel so devoid of that same charisma that was present in the first two games. In my opinion, there's a lot of parts in this game that honestly reach the point of parody for me. That's how bad some of the writing in this game can get sometimes, or at least boring. Like, this game really feels a lot like PewDiePie 2022 compared to PewDiePie 2012, you know what I mean? Fuck it, before the bridge. <laughs> There were a few parts that I thought were really cool and I was actually interested in, but really overall it's just nothing compared to the original Bayonetta games. Like, this game honestly lacks a lot of the style and charisma that made up the first two games. I think a good example of this is just the intro cutscene alone. Everything about it just feels weird, like there's something missing. For example, when Bayonetta first turns into the whole thing, gets the purple fucking... I don't know, it's just not really that cool compared to the first two ones, like when Bayonetta was in the graveyard and fucking the lights were flashing and she was doing all this crazy shit. That was so cool. You had the fucking bow, 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 bow. Let's dance boys fucking damn. Oh my god, give me that now. <laughs> Going back to my original climax, I did mention that while I didn't understand the story itself and I didn't really care for it, I loved the characters. I love the funny ass banter that certain characters would always have with Bayonetta. Characters like Mr. Redgrave and the third PlayStation always had some real gorgule busting lines while communicating with Bayonetta like I'm told normal humans do. I wouldn't know because I'm a clown, but come on. Come on. <laughs> but again, this game just doesn't go on that same frequency in my opinion like there's so many moments where characters will be talking to each other like luca will say one of his famous lines to bayonetta and it's just uh, it's just not authentic in my opinion you can definitely tell the discrepancy between when the game's released like it's insane I honestly couldn't tell you one funny ass line or any great quotes from any character that stood out in this game. The only time I actually laughed at any joke in this game was when after Bayonetta makes a small dig, Jean just randomly calls her a bitch out of nowhere. Like, I don't even know why I found it so funny, it just completely came out of left field. Like, damn girl! <laughs> hey. You shut the hell up! Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry about that guys. But yeah, I think overall, if I had to drive the point home, this is just fucking boring. Like, this really reminds me of a Marvel movie in a lot of ways, like I mentioned earlier. Like, yeah, there's a plot and there's intricacies and stuff, but who fucking cares? Like, multiverse stuff by this point has been so overdone and so fucking jammed into my goddamn throat. 
eyes and mouth and fucking ears. It's so boring and it's so overdone. Ugh. Uh, and the thing is, there are some cool parts to this game. There are really cool scenes. The ending, where the other two Bayonettas come out and fight the fucking singular Aeus or whatever, that shit was awesome. And I honestly really liked that. That was probably the most hype part of Bayonetta 3, but really besides that, nothing. Really just a nothing plotline. It sucks, because the first two games really had some good shit going on. Sure, I said in my original stuff that I didn't really care for it, but that's because, like I said, I couldn't understand it because of the game. Now that I've kind of got a grip on the games themselves and I have an idea of how they play, and now that I have time to focus my energy on the plot, this shit just fucking... Oh, it's so bad. Like, even Bayonetta 2, as little of importance that the story really had on me in that game... There were still some cool ass moments like when Balder met Rose again, that was a great moment. And you know, there were a couple scenes in there too that were great. But this just drops to a whole new low. There were two scenes that I went, wow, and that was it. The whole rest of the time I was watching all the cutscenes in this game was honestly just a speed run to see how fast I could skip them, because it's just, it's that boring. But yeah incredibly disappointing and as far as characters go as well bayonetta is okay she's voiced by a new voice actress as you saw by the uh intro she's very good but the material that she's given in this game again it just doesn't feel there's something missing and it's the same thing with every other character in this game especially fucking luca like there's some crazy shit that happens in this game where luca turns into some fucking angel from heaven he's like the the truth seeker like i don't know what the fuck is going on i'm just standing there going man this game needs to end now oh my goodness and there's like just a bunch of that in this game and another character <laughs> yes oh my god What the hell is this? That's right, it's Viola. Holy shit, what a rabbit hole I have to go down here, good god. Now so far I've been talking about all the characters and you know how I compared them to the original games to now, but Viola is obviously a new standout main character in this game and uh... Oof, what a what a gal, huh? What a what an interesting human being, I must say. So if you don't already know by just the tone of my voice itself, Viola's character and storyline is one of the most controversial parts of the entire game, mostly because of two things. One is that her entire character is pretty much just a mixture of Nero from Devil May Cry and Trunks from Di Yeah. I love Trunks, I'm sorry. <laughs> but basically, the biggest criticism is her archetype is, at best, a hot-headed, punk rock, teenage swords person with pink hair who travels from another timeline to warn one of her parents about an interdimensional villain who's coming to destroy the planet and fucking rule the world something, and suck up two androids, and then become perfect and rule the world. And that person... I don't know where I'm going with this, damn. I, I'm horrible at writing, <laughs> holy shit. She only has one weapon that can manually get set on fire if needed. She curses a lot. She has that Avril Lavigne, Paramour, fucking all-time low 2007 ass theme song. Yeah, you get my point. A lot of people hate this character. But the question is, do I agree 
with these totally reputable and trusted critics on Viola? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, sorry. I think the biggest issue with Viola isn't necessarily that she's a bad character. I don't think you necessarily have to reinvent the wheel over and over again, but holy shit, this writing that she has sucks. Like, shit like this, for example. Maybe a bit too heavy for your little paws, kitty. Oh, don't make me say it again! My name is Viola! V-I-O-L fucking A! Viola! Yeah, that ain't gonna cut it, Junior. You gotta cut that shit out, girl. That, oh my god, that... That is the crin some of the cringiest dialogue I've ever heard in my life. And I curse more than her. <laughs> oh, oh. But what I find kind of ironic about this whole thing is this is almost identical in what happened to Nero in DMC4. While there was no doubt that Nero's character had potential, it never really felt like they actually accomplished anything by the end because of that weak-ass writing and presentation in DMC4. No one wanted Nero to be anything when DMC4 came out, and it's why I'm happy that Nero got a second chance in DMC5, because Capcom eventually knocked it out of the park with his character, but going back to Viola, I think a good example of the poor ass development is during the first or second boss fight with fucked up Luca. In the middle of the encounter, Viola turns into some demonic bird and assaults Luca the same way I do a pack of those orange chocolate Milano cookies. I violate those motherfuckers like a fly in a frog's mouth. <laughs> Give me a sign, God. Give me a sign. I guess it's supposed to be kind of this big moment, like, uh, fuck it, I guess Nero, when he goes into his devil trigger, he does that whole anime, I won't let you die, fucking goes up the powerful ass music, fucking <laughs> but I didn't really feel anything from when Viola did it, like, it just, it felt like a fucking crumb falling on the floor. That's how much impact that moment had. And the reason I'm doubling down so much on this is because of what happens at the end of the game. And after certain events that I'll talk about in just a second, Bayonetta gives the official title of Bayonetta to Viola, making her, you guessed it, the new Bayonetta going forward in this series from now on. Forever. For every single game after this has Viola as Bayonetta, and... <sighs> you guys know I'm an honest clown, as I had to start a race. And I have a deep respect for Hideki Kamiya's writing and his style. I think it's different. I think it's funny. But the fact that this unit of a human being is now the main protagonist of this fucking series is something I really can't even begin to wrap my head around. Like, holy fuck. Because whenever a passing of the torch is done, per se, in a game series, it's usually done over a huge period of time. Characters like Nero from Devil May Cry once again, or Raiden from Metal Gear, these fucking purebred silver-headed freaks really didn't become great until their second or third appearance in their respective games. And in my opinion, the decision just to straight up give the title of Bayonetta, like that's a title you can just give, I didn't even know that, to Viola is kind of ill-timed. I feel like if she was established over the course of a couple games, it would have been fine when she eventually would have got the mantle. If you would have told me that from now on, Nero, going back to fucking Nero again, would be the main protagonist for every single Devil May Cry game from here on out, I'd be at least content with that. But that's only because he was given a complete makeover as a character, like I mentioned earlier. So much so that his earlobes are now attached to his head instead. <laughs> The problem with throwing a brand new protagonist like an Ethan Winters, for example, into a series with heavily established characters and a patented style, it isn't always the best move. It ultimately depends on both the right time and the right place to pull the fucking trigger. And in my opinion, this shit ain't it. I definitely think Virjola definitely has potential, and I think she could be a cool character, but not right now. It needs, she needs a lot more time. 
Like, just for example's sake, imagine if in Metal Gear 2, Snake had just fucking died, and then Raiden just all of a sudden took his place. Like, this is how that feels. Like, imagine Metal Gear 3, 4, 5, Raiden was just the protagonist. Like, yeah, it would be cool, but if you didn't have 2, 3, and 4 to build Raiden up, I think he's in Metal Gear 3, I'm a fake fan. <laughs> then it wouldn't have felt earned, and it wouldn't have felt like a proper passing of the torch, and this is what that feels like. Sorry, Viola. You're just not ready yet, girl. Well, while I can honestly sit here all day talking about how shitty the writing is, I will admit my brain is going to fry, and these orcs need to be cooked. So instead, let's skip to the ending, like most motherfuckers did in the boss ranking, shall we? Which is by far the most controversial part of the game, the ending. During the ending of the game, Bayonetta, after reaching her triumphant climax like I do with those orange Milano cookies, <laughs> along with Luca Redgrave, who for some reason is now just in a full-on romantic relationship with this version of Bayonetta, like they never explain that, both of them get dragged down to hell. Let me repeat this, Bayonetta dies and goes to fucking hell, much like those orange Milano cookies do when they hit my fucking pit of my stomach. <laughs> like that's where the damn devil lives, dude. But all jokes aside, this is probably the most controversial part of Bayonetta 3 and really has a ton of people pissed, even more than Viola getting the new title of Bayonetta. On one hand, I will say I respect the writers over at Platinum for having the balls to just straight up fucking kill off their main character. But at the same time, like I said earlier, I feel like this was very ill-timed. And I feel like they should have done a lot better of a job at kind of mentioning they should give the mantle over. They did kind of do that in the game, where Singularity kept saying like, Oh, Bayonetta, your time is up, but... It didn't feel natural. It didn't feel like real. I don't know. It's it's fucking stupid. And again, it's just what I've been saying throughout this entire first part. It's boring and it's just really it's really disappointing in my opinion. I'm at a loss for words at how bland this plot kind of feels. Like honestly, I've probably watched or read this exact plot line two or three times in the form of a movie or a book or a comic book or a manga it's it's been done to death the whole multiversal plot line oh you know blah 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 my time is up you know it's it's boring it really is but just for funsies let's compare a very similar event that happens in one of my favorite games over the last decade and i know there's gonna be some motherfuckers in the comment section that'll hit me for this much like my father Red Dead Redemption 2, baby. Hell yeah. Get out of bed, you lazy bastard. What? Come on, partner. In Red Dead Redemption 2, halfway through the game, the titular protagonist, Arthur Morgan, gets TB, tuberculosi. And obviously, since he's an older man, and since it's also during the Wild West era where there's no possible medication or cure, you know this fucking guy is going to croak, die perish, get destroyed by nature. It's like that one episode of Spongebob. <laughs> you know, dying for pie. <laughs> and this fucking, and this channel, please. <laughs> but on top of that sickness, there's also the whole drama with his main gang, the Dutch Vanderlyn gang, and all this other bullshit that goes down. It sucks. You know shit is going to go down, and you also know that Arthur is close to death. So naturally, most normal people's reaction is to cherish every moment with Arthur. Cherish all those goddamn horse physics you possibly can. Because when that moment happens in the game when Arthur inevitably dies, it sucks. It's heartbreaking, but it was inevitable. That's what makes Arthur such a good protagonist. And really what makes Red Dead 2 such a good game, despite these motherfuckers that say it's overrated, I know where you live! It's truly a damn shame though, I really would have loved to see a lot more out of what this series could have done as far as the plot goes, but hey, as they say, if you truly love something, you have to let it go. So, I guess by that stretch, I gotta let it go. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Ooh, come back to me. <laughs> Fuck. This was supposed to be the third climax. <laughs> oh, shit, man. <laughs> All I have are these fucking precious orcs. I gotta go cook them. Hold on. Ah. Hello. Hold on. I'm almost done. Hold on. These orcs, you know, they tell. Oh, boy, I tell you, they're hard to make. Okay, let's go. I'm ready. Someone turn that goddamn music off. Oh. Well, unfortunately, while the story could have been a little better in a few places, especially in some places, at the end of the day, this is a hack and slash game. You don't need to have this whole story like God of War or Last of Us to impress people. At the end of the day, what you really need is good art design and good gameplay. That is what makes games like Devil May Cry, God of War, the OG series, not the fucking... Woo! Never mind, never mind. But these next two levels that I'm going to discuss... <laughs> These next two parts that I'm going to talk about will either break or make Bayonetta 3, in my opinion, and from what I've obviously seen, it's kind of disappointing as well, but let's talk about it. Let's see what we can find out. Now, the first thing I want to get to is graphics. As you might have noticed so far, the quality of this game is significantly, or at least a little worse compared to my video on Bayonetta 1, which was recorded on Steam and through my PC. And that's because of the fact, first of all, that I'm using a shitty $15 capture card. Thanks, Nintendo. But, unfortunately, I cannot showcase the proper fidelity that this game is meant to be seen in. But, even if I had the capability to showcase these types of graphics, this game honestly doesn't look all that great. And, while I could put the blame on Platinum like a lot of people did, this is honestly more on Nintendo's side itself. What I mean is, if you aren't very technically sound, the hardware specs for a base model Nintendo Switch is somewhere equal to a slightly modified PlayStation 3 Slim. That's right, meaning that this game is technically running on hardware equivalent to a console made over a decade ago, and it really shows. But it's not just this game either. Almost every first party release on the Switch over the past two years or so, really every game has had ridiculous polish issues. Just look at fucking Pokemon that came out a couple months ago. So while many uneducated folk have been pointing the finger at Platinum, in reality the blame falls on Nintendo for their lack of prowess when it comes to the Switch's capability. Or at least 75% of it. There have been several patches that have been released since launch, that have kind of fixed the game's frame rate and graphics, but even then, like they say, you only get one chance to make a first impression, and uh, man, some of these frame rates were uh, spicy at launch, let me tell you. <laughs> I was there. I would know. I swear. I swear it. There were some spots, mostly during gameplay, where they dropped as low as 30 to 15 frames a second. And while I'm one of those motherfuckers who put gameplay over graphics, you know, yeah, I'm one of those guys. You better watch out for me, boy. Seeing this game struggle to keep a solid 60 frames is honestly upsetting to see. And yeah, I am aware that I can also emulate or overclock my Switch and turn it to butter. But it still brings another issue to light, and that's the bare bone art design. One of the things that I loved about the original Bayonetta games was their art design. Despite their lack of graphical fidelity, they always made up for that in a bountiful harvest of unique and insane levels of design throughout the first two games. Shit like color design, character design, enemy design, gun design, level design, fucked harder than my damn future. So with all that being said, does Bayonetta 3 manage to top both of those games in art design and everything? No. One of the biggest issues I had with the art design almost immediately was the environmental design. 
which compared to previous Bayonetta games, oh my god, Bayonetta 1 and 2 had some gorgeous ass area design, and sure, Bayonetta 2 had some of the same textures from Bayonetta 1, but whatever, dude, fucking look at it, man, that shit looks so cool, oh my god, even to this day, the graphics still hold up, like, it looks so cool, just fucking look at the enemy design, everything, it's just insane shit on my screen. Good god. Everything just had so much complexity to it, like everything from the characters' outfits to just the fucking floor textures. I, know, I can't really explain it, it just looks so cool, man. But one of the things I was really interested in for this game was the type of environmental design. In this game, since it is a multiversal game, you travel around different countries and different areas like New York City, which is uh, fucking been destroyed, god damn it, not again. The city of Egypt, well, more like the fucking desert of Egypt, good god. Bloodborne, and many other locations. Like, there's this one part in the game called... Gin... 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 Get Jin Yeah, I'm done. Oh Gingyu Gingyu Gap looks pretty cool. There's an area with like a forest on like falling rocks. It looks like Fortnite, you know, season whatever they're on now. I don't know. I'm old as fuck. But the interdimensional portals with the pink crystals or whatever. Gingyu Gap. Yeah, that was pretty cool. But even then, you only see some of these areas for like fifteen minutes or less. Most of the game is spent in these bland-ass areas like Egypt and New York and all that stuff. And honestly, it could have been a lot more fleshed out. Especially with all the rich details, like how much fucking garbage and shit should have been in the New York level, for example. Like, there ain't no way when a tsunami hits New York that there is not so much trash there. There's, oh my god, have you seen, like, Long Island? Just go and look in the water. Like, <laughs> no way! But at the end of the day, like I said earlier, it's not necessarily Platinum's fault. It's more or less Nintendo's fault because, you know, of the way the Switch had to handle this stuff. Apparently, from what I heard, this game was supposed to be open world at a certain point, which, uh... <laughs> if this game was open world after games like Elden Ring, oh my... I would have been legit mind broke. Like, <laughs> if, if you thought Bayonetta dying was fucked up for me... Dude, just imagine if, oh, oh, gotta get on with this review, oh, I'm sorry, oh. But at the end of the day, my pussy isn't in a knot. Like I said, this is not necessarily Platinum's fault, although with that open world shit, it, it certainly could have been, but I'm not necessarily pissed. It's just, we're starting to get to the point where games are starting to look closer to real life each year. After all, just look at what they'll be like in 2013. Damn, Mario's looking good. But I was at least hoping that in terms of art design, it would look a little bit better than Bayonetta 1 and 2. And it honestly looks kind of worse. And again, I know that's not necessarily Platinum's fault, but fuck Nintendo, dude. I honestly, you know, you want to talk about these fucking alternate realities and multiverses? I would love to live in a reality where Bayonetta 3 came out on fucking Steam, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, <laughs> Xbox Two, holy shit. Oh, Bayonetta, imagine the ass of Bayonetta in 4K, dude. Oh my god, run. Uh, hello, future Happy Gorius here, or am I? Hmm. Anyways, while I'm editing this video, there was an art book that released a couple days ago called The Eyes of Bayonetta 3, or something like that, but after buying this book totally 100% legally, I just wanted to show you some unused concept art from this book, which just goes insanely hard, and I wanted to do this just to further drive my point in about how far from grace this level design fell, because holy fuck, this goes insane. The first two concepts I want to show you are Noah Tun from Bayonetta 2 and Vigrid from Bayonetta 1, which would have been in Bayonetta 3. Both harbor their own unique, desolate atmospheres, which no doubt would have played a part in Bayonetta 3's original plot, which would have involved the three versions of Sarazza that, 
in all honesty, from what I'm reading, would have been a way better plot than what we've ended up with. These areas, while reused, are always just stunning to look at, and would have doubled as nice references and also good backdrops for the purpose of the plot, which I'm sure would have been to introduce Bayonetta 1 Bayonetta and B2 Bayonetta. In terms of completely original stuff that was unused, I have this. Look at this. This right here is the Cathedral of Cascades from Bayonetta 2, which somehow would have turned into a fucking spider boss and would have had B1 Sarazza and B2 Sarazza fight it, from what I'm seeing here. And to be honest, this shit makes my fucking blood boil. This is the kind of shit I was saying when I wanted that depth and that complexity in the graphics and the level design. And from what I'm looking at, this would have been it. Oh, oh my god. Like... Tell me another game where you see a fucking spider church come out out of the ground. Because there's none that come to mind for me. But it's interesting to know that they had crazy shit like this in mind. And it's so fucked up that we didn't see this in the game. It just goes to show you that the original director for Bayonetta 3, Yusuke Hashimoto's departure, fucked over the game big style. That or they just scrapped the whole spider guy away from abode idea with the three Sarazas. Either way, it's straight up a fucking crime, like I said, that we didn't get shit like this in Bayonetta 3, because it would've went hard. And believe me when I tell you, I'm just scratching the surface. There's the early design from some sort of homunculi boss, including Viola in the bottom, the singularity boss fight, which looks like some shit out of outer space, like, man. This would've been great, and, oh, it looks so good. Like, there's the Doom Eternal concept art, and even the DMC4 and DMC5 concept art. You know, that looks kind of the same, but it still would have looked better. But this, I don't even know. Like, the final product does not compare to whatever this could have been. Imagine, imagine, man. Uh, oh well. I apologize for intruding. Back to past Happy Gorius, who is slowly edging towards the brink of insanity after losing his climax partner, Brave Sarazza. Continue, my friend, I'm sorry. <laughs> However, something that I will criticize Platinum on is the character designs, which, again, just look weird. Like, Bayonetta still looks fine as hell, the scrupulous beer salesman, Rodon, still looks pretty cool, the PlayStation 3 is still running wild, but Man, some of these character designs just look really fucking weird. Like, I don't know what the hell happened with some of these characters. For example, Jean looks like she robbed a whole circus at gunpoint and just wore the whole thing. Like, <laughs> what's going on? Sigurd, that dude looks like the fucking witch from Narnia. Luca straight up looks like he killed and cooked the original Luca with oil from $69, chili from hell, pepper from Chernobyl, bread from dead chubacabra, and crocodile meat. That motherfucker, he looks crazy. He's looking weird. But by far, one of the weirdest designs in this game is Viola. Like, I don't, I don't know, dog. This chick looks like she went to an MGK concert or something and said, Yep, this is my whole personality now. <laughs> and then rated a hot topic. Now, I'm not one to judge anyone for their own decisions, except the orcs. But by Jeryu Klykondikoik, we gotta do something about this damn lipstick, girl. Like, that shit is brighter than my damn future, once again. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, no. Of course, speaking of character designs, Bayonetta also has an arrangement of skins in this game, much like she had from the other games. But the difference this time is there are multiple Bayonettas, since this is once again a MCU-ass plotline. There are several Bayonettas out there. There's French Bayonetta, Chinese Bayonetta, um, um, uh, um, oh, Dude, Egyptian ba- oh my god, dude. Egyptian bayonet is so fucking hot, dude, oh my god. <laughs> but yeah, there are a clown car's worth of skins and styles in this game. And I guess technically they're not skins, they are different bayonetas. Although, most of them end up dying in the game after you get the skin. What the- f holy fuck. Wait, did she steal their clothes after they died? What the f- alright. Anyway, most of these multiversal skins go hard as fuck, 
But if I were to tell you my favorites, I'd have to whittle it down to either the Egyptian skin or the damn Chinese skin, dude. Oh my god, she can fucking... She can bing chilling. She can bing my chilling whenever she wants. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, we get racist on Brain Alert. <laughs> but yeah, that that uh that piece of fine meat can fucking love me long time. You know what I'm saying? Oh my god. Oh, I uh, this video is the worst video I've ever made. I swear. Don't worry, because it goes even deeper than this hole, gentlemen. That's right, there is a new feature in this game where you can now customize the colors of each skin. Granted, you have the halos to boot, and while I appreciate the attention to detail, I gotta be honest, these colors are way too bright. Like, maybe if they toned down some of the colors, they would have worked, but holy fuck, like, at this rate, I'm, I'm gonna go blind, hug. And I, I'm already, um, my vision's already fucked enough as is, oh my, oh my goodness gracious. But, at the end of the day, I can appreciate the level of detail on the devs' part. That was very nice of them to put in. But, something that I can undisputedly, without a shadow of a doubt say, is probably the best part of this art design, besides all the other shit, is the fucking battle music for this game. Some of this shit goes so incredibly hard. This shit, like, like brick hard. No, 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 no. Kurt Angle on the perk hard. Holy, like this, I, you could put the greatest song on earth up against some of this shit, and it would, it would probably beat it. Like, put fucking, put like Ludwig's theme from Bloodborne up against Rodon's boss theme in this game. That would be a fight for the millions to watch, oh my goodness. There's some other themes in this game, there's Moonlight Serenade, which is the main battle music for Bayonetta. Uh, that's okay, it's whatever. There's Viola's theme. G G oh, Ghost. Oh, I I get it. I I get with the, I get it. This song, like I said earlier, definitely has that Avril Lavigne Paramore 2007 ass sound to it, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Although I will say this song, strangely, hear me out. Strangely, kind of feels familiar, and I I don't know why. I just oh, oh. Oh, I see. But, look, instead of me just autistically rambling on about the music, just do me a favor and go and listen to the music by yourself, okay? I'm not the kind of guy you want telling you about production sound or meaning or uh, bips and bops and sounds and all this bullshit. Do, go and listen to it after you watch this video, please. I'm begging you to listen to some of these fucking heat, this heat that these men have produced. It's so good. Fucking... I'm gonna come. Oh my god. <laughs> one small detail, one very small detail that I noticed that there weren't many of in this game were the many still image cutscenes that were in the original first two games. All of those cutscenes were seemingly shortened in this game in favor of longer and more fully animated cutscenes, and it honestly felt kind of weird without those still image cutscenes. And while I understand that they had to do those types of cutscenes probably due to a budget, I still think it gave the past two games a little bit more of an identity. Like, it made them, in a weird way, kinda unique in a lot of ways. And, in a weird way, for this game, I feel like the fully animated cutscenes kinda take away from that trademark style. For some strange reason, I don't really know. It also probably has something to do with the fact that, out of all three games, Bayonetta 3 has the most cutscenes out of the entire series, which... Oh, what the fuck is it? ...honestly is not a good thing because, holy shit, some of these cutscenes can straight up go to hell. Like, I'll admit, I've watched several streamers play this game during my long hours of research, and a lot of them just end up straight up skipping the cutscenes. A ton of them could not be fucked to pay attention to any of these cutscenes, and honestly, I can agree with several of them. To a certain extent, maybe that's just me. Maybe I really enjoyed those types of cutscenes, and uh, I don't know. At the end of the day, I just felt really weird about it, and honestly, it kind of drives the point home to what I said earlier about this game just kind of feeling like a parody of Bayonetta in a lot of ways, because, I don't know, it's just really odd, in my opinion. But... Realistically, that kind of harbors my thoughts on the art design as a whole. Like, 
there are some good looking parts in this game they definitely look better than bayonetta's one and two but overall just comparing certain things to bayonetta one and two it just doesn't look as good for example the enemy design in this game uh, they just don't look as good as the original enemies like i said earlier bayonetta one and two had such complexity with some of the shit in those games like the enemies looked amazing in those games there was so much little details and just so much shit on them that made them look cool and unique and compared to the new enemies in this game which i think are called the homunculi i don't know they just don't look as cool they're like these fucking green things that just but it's just examples like that that pretty much drive home the point that at the end of the day the art style for bayonetta 3 is mid <laughs> Alright, well, if the art design isn't all particularly that great, if the storyline kind of sucks, if it has missed potential, whatever, that's fine. But the real meat of this pig, the real foot of this pig that I really care about at the end of the day, really it's the only thing I care about, is the fucking gameplay. And surprisingly, unlike the art design and the story, the gameplay in my opinion, is the best part of Bayonetta 3 hands down, and I'd like to tell you why. First, I gotta eat this fucking orb. Oh. oh! Oh! Oh my god! Oh! Oh! While Bayonetta 3 is pretty much your standard Bayonetta experience, with all your favorites like guns. <laughs> Bayonetta 3 is, in theory, your standard Bayonetta experience, with all of your favorites like guns, whipping, torture, dancing, the end of Israel, let it die! Ah, ha, ha. This video does not reflect the thoughts of Happy Gorius and Brain Alert as its own. <laughs> it's all here for you to enjoy. But, what if I told you that there's more? Oh my god, no way! Obviously, since this is a sequel, there are a lot of new toys to play around with. And the first of these is one of the most fucking awesome and most controversial additions to B3, and that is the Demon Slave System. <laughs> yes. And when you think about it, it makes sense. Since there are enemies bigger than the rides at Glagoland in this game, naturally you're gonna need some bigger guns, because as a great man once said, size always matters. Or does it, brother? If you want a basic rundown of the Demon Slave system, I can basically tell you that it works pretty much like V from DMC5. You know, when you fucking sit there finger blasting yourself to the tune of Through the Fire and the Flames while taking control of your little pets, firing out the same one or two combos over and over again, while wasting your precious time and existence on this earth in Bloody Palace, only to get to King Cerberus in room 97 and become his dog food. Oh, I just want to beat the game. I just want to platinum. Anyway, by Odin's beard. I actually really love this system. Somehow the devs over at Platinum managed to take one of the most over-the-top series in recent history and top it tenfold. Absolutely insane. From what I heard up the clown tree, these features were actually ported over from the cancelled Scalebound game since the director of this game was actually poised to work on Scalebound. Which is big if true because, much like the cancelled project, I kinda didn't give a shit about this system at first, to be completely honest with you. The main complaint I and a lot of other people had when the game came out about the semen delayed system is that it kind of ruins the pacing of the combat at first, mostly because of how horribly molasses level slow the slave combat is. That and the insane camera placements as well. It's definitely a little jarring at first, definitely because I'm so used to that Bayonetta style, especially after playing 2. But to quote one Joker gang on Instagram, sir. This the horror lost some Rompalion. However, after discovering a neat little trinket nicknamed the Nucleus of Talos, I quickly realized I wasn't truly making my balls think like God intended. You see, the main gimmick of this Nucleus of Talos 
is that it allows you to basically let the slave attack without you actually doing anything. All you have to do is hold ZL. Because as long as you don't get hit while in slave mode, you can basically let your demons go ruthless mode without you actually doing anything. And even if you don't like holding ZL, I'll give you another happy glorious tip. You see, you don't actually really have to use the demon slave like you're supposed to. You can actually do a secret technique that I like to call a happy glorious secret TM. If you successfully time a slave button, which is ZL, to a combo, you will obliterate anybody in your path. All you have to do is just do a combo and then press ZL at the end. It works great, especially if you're low on magic or you just don't like summoning demons in the first place. See. At the end of the day, you don't have to rely on the slave mechanic to beat the big men, I told you. See, proving that size doesn't matter. Or does it, brother? I think another thing that really warmed me up to the Demon of Song system was how much variety was packed inside of this bitch. There's a lot of different demon slaves, from a damn train, a demonic stripper, a fucking building can be used, a fr- No! They- They yassified Bile! And his brother Dagon! What the hell is going on? Well, anyway. Yeah, a lot of these freaks seem to have some sort of depth, surprisingly, and it was very refreshing to see. I kinda thought they wouldn't go as far as Gamora, but that's really, really fucking cool. And I'm glad to see it. If I had to pick a favorite, it'd probably come down to either the train, the goddamn tower where you can turn into a fucking robot like Bayonetta 2, or Madam Butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, pretty good shit, Kojima. Keep it up, bro. Seriously, Death Stranding 3, I hope this shit is in. I, if it's not, it's over, bro. I don't know what to tell you. What if I told you there's something more crazier than a yassified sissy frog from hell? You're damn right, it's the weapons my friend, and there's a lot of them in this game. There is a pig's feast of depth that is the weapon design, and it's fucking amazing in Bayonetta 3. You could clearly tell that despite the graphics or the story, the devs made sure to put that damn dedication into several new and debuting weapons in this game. And honestly, it's so refreshing compared to Bayonetta 2's weapon design, which despite the fact that I ate men for breakfast and shit down their neck with both the Rakshashas and the Alruna whip, realistically there wasn't an insane upgrade to B2, especially compared to Bayonetta 1's weapon design, which I was hoping for, but it's refreshing to see that that shallow weapon design in Bayonetta 2 was somewhat of a fluke compared to Bayonetta 3, which just has so much variety, it's insane. So insane, I don't even know where to start. I guess we can start with the good old Ig Ignis Arane, Ign the phantom weapon, and by god what an unholy piece of technology we have here. Remember back to my first climax, how I said that these devs have nothing but putrid, horrible thoughts lying inside of their heads? Well so do I, because goddamn what a perfect weapon for this game. And I say that because this weapon, not only is it fast as fuck, but it has that length. Perfect for a game like Bayonetta 3, where not only are the enemies fast as Foxy, but for some reason they just don't want to come close to you, so this weapon is fucking great for that. I also just like the aesthetic of this weapon, or the design, it just looks cool. You also slide around when you sprint, that's just awesome. I love this weapon. You turn into a fucking sexy Quilog spider, and you can rope around the fucking map. This is, it's an awesome, it's an awesome weapon. Not a gun, an awesome fucking yo-yo. I love this. God. <laughs> She's gone! Another weapon on the based list is the Dead End Express, or as I like to call it, the motherfucking train saw. Yeah! Let's go! This weapon is insane. This is, this is the pinnacle of what I like to call a Joker weapon. They literally just stole the gimmick from Cavalier Angelo in DMC5, but they took it and made it a train. It is perfect. And really, what else do I need to say? It's just, it's a perfect weapon. It's fucking, 
you hit people, it does the there's like fire on it. It's so cool, dude. Oh my god, I'm gonna, I'm, oh, dude. And also, by the way, I forgot to mention, I never thought I would see the day where Bayonetta would turn into a sexy train. <laughs> I never, what the fuck, man? Other based weapons include the Ribbit Libido BZ55, a spear type weapon that, in addition to having sound waves as long range attacks, can also buff your attacks and give you defense buffs. I bet you one cookie that the devs probably just went, oh, what other crazy ass weapons can we put in this game? And this is what came out of it. And you know, by this point, I've just completely beaten this horse dead at this point. But only in Bayonetta will you see a fucking microphone stand with high heels for support. <laughs> <laughs> they, they yassified a fucking microphone, and I love it. I'm here for it all. I have the chaos. I, I love it, dude. We also have the Abracadabra hat, or whatever it's called, which looks like a prize that you'd win at Glagoland. This also goes insane. The main gimmick of this weapon is that you can summon all kinds of wacky shit out of this hat. It's, it's insane. Crazy. Play the game and see what I mean, seriously. You can also summon bats which for some reason just do a fuck ton of damage. I don't know what's going on. You also have the returning Alruna, Simoon, Cruel Alti, Altia, Alti, Alti, Cassopia, the Ca the Cassopi, the G Pillar, etc. Now these weapons I straight up haven't tried or haven't even unlocked them yet because look man, I'm I'm old, okay? I'm literally a god. It takes me a while to get through these games, okay? I still haven't finished Elden Ring since release, but god, these weapons are so fucking good. Using these weapons in the game is almost more satisfying than eating orc steak. Oh, But it goes so hard in this game that the devs even included a feature where if you have save data from Bayonetta 1 or 2, then you'll receive the Scarborough Affair and the Love is Blue guns in-game. And in addition, they have the exact same moveset down to the input delay, and that's fucking awesome. It's honestly probably my favorite detail in the gameplay. If only they put the same into the storyline. <laughs> fucking. But much like everything else in life, there's always a bad side, and in this case, Viola, baby, she's back. The hate train starts again. Come on, Twitter, let's go. Yeah. Viola's moveset in this game is uh rough to say the least, and the reason why, especially compared to Bayonetta, is because Viola only comes equipped with one weapon, one ranged weapon, and one demon slave. That's right. But probably the biggest change compared to Bayonetta is the parry. That's right. Just due to Viola's tank-like structure, oh my god, look at- I mean, that's- that's a defensive position. She can block enemies' attacks instead of dodging like Bayonetta does. This feature right here probably has the most hate garnered towards Viola as far as anything else goes. And it's mainly because of the fact that you have to be perfect at that parry. Because if you aren't, then you won't have as much witch time as you want. You have to be absolutely perfect to get that amount of witch time to do her attacks, and since she kind of has slower attacks, you have to have a lot of witch time, and if you don't, then it's over. You're gonna have to rely on Cheshire. Now, I myself have very differing opinions on Viola's parry. On one hand, I think it's kind of stupid, mostly because I've spent the entire series trying to perfect the witch time dodge and just when I've almost got it down. And now I'm forced to all of a sudden learn a completely new character's limited moveset. It's definitely jarring at first, but at the same time, I've also played games like Devil May Cry and Dark Souls. I've put my time into Royal Guard and parrying respectfully. While I'm not the best, I'm also not the worst at parrying. I've got the simplicity down. And I also did my time during the Virgil boss fight in DMC5. However, much like the Demon Slave solution, what if I told you there's another happy gorious free secret? That's right. Hear me out. I'm gonna tell you something you're not prepared to hear. You won't, you won't be ready for this shit. I've actually never used Viola's parry until I had to do it for this video. The entire time I've played as Viola, I have used the moon of Mahakala. That's right. 
If you remember back to my first climax, I said during the gameplay part that there was a royal guard in Bayonetta, and I wasn't fucking lying. Once I realized how much trouble I was going to have, I wasted no time handing over that Zenny for that damn blocking action. And what's great about this Happy Gorius branded secret is not only is this faster than her parry, but you can block pretty much any attack an enemy throws at you. Granted, the only downside to this is I have no idea how to activate which time. Who wrote this? Who wrote this? But it is a worthy trade-off at the end of the day, and it is my opinion the best accessory in any of the games. They're in every single game, but fuck anyone who tells me otherwise, because damn it, oh, it's so good. I need it. I, I'm desperate without it. Just, just please, just embrace Shiva as a blessing, motherfucker. But going back to Viola's weaponry, personally, I don't think any of the weapons Viola does have, the only ones she has, aren't that bad. I think straight up trashing someone just because their moveset sucks is typical human tomfoolery. There's nothing wrong with developers experimenting and breaking the typical trademarked style of their past games with a new character. The main problem I personally have is that after a while her moves just get boring. Like there's only so much you can do with, like I said, one of each weapon. There is an extreme shelf life to a character who, again, has one of each weapon, damn it, compared to Bayonetta's fucking 35 weapons. It's, again, it's a bit polarizing to me. It, it fucking breaks me. But, you know, it's just ironic because there's another character that just was just like Viola. Oh, people reacted the same just like Viola. Who could it be? Oh, Wow, it's Nero! I never expected to compare Nero to Viola at all. <laughs> oh, how surprising. But seriously, one of the main complaints with Nero in DMC4, besides that nerf Vulcan ass sound effect for the Blue Rose, was the fact that Nero also had one of each weapon. And sure, while Nero also had stuff like the Devil Bringer and the cool Red Queen effect where you can set it on fire. It still got real stale really fast, especially when you start doing more than two playthroughs. You really start to notice it after a while. I'd really like to know who the hell decided to completely model Viola off of Nero, because there's way too many similarities. Like, I'm, I'm fucking tired of comparing her to this man. God damn. But at the end of the day, dog, it is what it is. After all, at least Viola isn't a reskin of Bayonetta like Jean and Mr. Rip were. But hopefully, even if there is a Bayonetta 4, unless fucking Platinum Games crumbles and gets bought by uh, some scrupulous Asian men, then I hope to God that they give Viola the Nero treatment. Because I, for one, am very excited for Viola. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, Bayonetta's potential. Oh, fucking, you see what I mean? Oh, I, oh, whatever. I'll get over it. I'll get over it. Another controversial part of the gameplay is the amount of mini games you have to take part of in this game. If you aren't educated on the Bayonetta series of games, especially an hour into this video, there are a lot of parts that deviate from the standard hack and slash gameplay, not just viola, but there are many others that instead take on the form of several mini-games. For example, in Bayonetta 2 you had mini-games like the jet part, or the whale shooting part. Oh, iconic scenes. You to I totally know what I'm talking about. However, compared to those two, the mini-game button was seemingly fucking abused this time around, because there are a lot of mini-games in this game. Mini-games like the Jean Spy mission, or... Jean spy action level what was going on man <laughs> the madam butterfly bubble bath scene the froggered rhythm game those goddamn kaiju fights oh no not the not the kaiju fights but yeah there are a lot and while i did like a couple of these like the madam butterfly cloud bubble bath i thought that was hilarious the matter of the fact is, at the end of the day, that some of these quickly overstay their welcome after a while. While some of these were nice in the original games, they also weren't too annoying at the same time like they are here. 
The difference with the prior games is that, at least when these minigames were around, it kind of served as a momentum shift. You spent the whole game doing all these ridiculous ass combos and shit. It gave you kind of a, a break from the monotony, you know? But, well, I could go on and on. The greatest example I can give out of these minigames are the damn kaiju fights. During the course of the game, while pure chaos is ensuing, there are two kaiju fights that take place throughout the game, and Christ on the cross, what a slog of segments these are. Now, I myself love kaiju shit. I don't know if you knew this, but I, Happy Gorius the First Clown, I fucking love Godzilla. I love everything kaiju. It's... I love big monsters beating the shit out of each other. You know that what fucking... I love that one part, Godzilla shoves a tree down King Kong's throat. <laughs> I love that shit, dude. But the problem with the fights in this game is that they are way too fucking slow. I get that they were trying to be a little more realistic with the movement because of course in real life if there were actually like two kaijus they would move as slow as fucking molasses. But this is not the type of game that you would have that kind of movement in. This is like taking the Yakuza games and making them into an RPG. No. No. But yeah, some of these can get very annoying. It's not too annoying to the point where I straight up just hate the game, but some of these they could have cut out and I would have been fine with it. Maybe if they would have made it into a cutscene, I don't know, but at the end of the day, it's not that bad to the point where, again, I'm just like, fuck this game, dude, fuck. Oh. But hey, besides that and everything else I probably forgot, this is pretty much your average Bayonetta 3 gameplay experience. Albeit there are some small bumps in the road, it is what it is. At the end of the day, the gameplay of Bayonetta 3 wholesale is the main reason you should buy Bayonetta 3. It is that fun to fuck around with. Besides some of the bumps in the road, like I said, it's an absolute fucking blast to play this game. 10 Oprahs out of 10. Well, overall, Bayonetta 3 isn't the greatest game of all time. Hell, it isn't even the greatest game in its own franchise. However, despite some of my rather harsh criticisms and my straight up hatred, I still love this game at the end of the day. Yes, the plot is a little bit of a mess and formulaic and a little boring at times. The art design looked like the goddamn Divas Championship from WWE. But the gameplay is so fucking good that it single-handedly carries the game for me. It's so fluid and fun despite all the shit that I've said about this game. And that is really what matters at the end of the day. I would say this game is better than Sex with Bayonetta, but... <laughs> She's not there anymore. There's no more climaxes to be had. <laughs> Oh, damn it. Well, anyway, I think I'm gonna go jerk off now. So, stay safe, everyone. And remember, if you see an orc, do not be afraid to kill it and cook it, because they fucking killed my race. They killed the clowns, okay? You need to cook them now. Oh, oh well. Stay safe, everyone. I'm gonna go back home now. Goodbye.
Go back to me. Oh. What the fuck was that? What? Holy sh- What is that guy doing at my house? <laughs>